I do a lot of packing of musical instruments for shipment since uh, not only do I collect musical instruments and sometimes dispose of some of them to other collectors, but also I volunteer my time as a curator of a musical instrument museum and I often dispose of instruments that the museum does not want through eBay and then package, package those and ship them. I have a lot of experience doing this very successfully and I've developed a number of techniques and procedures for shipping the instruments and I thought I would share a number of those here in this video in the form of a number of case studies of different instruments and their configurations. First I want to qualify a couple of things. Uh, the instruments that I package for shipment are not intended for uh, the kind of situation where you'd build a crate for the instrument. This video is not intended to show how to package instruments in that way. It's intended for typical UPS type delivery of instruments and the kind of treatment they're likely to experience while being handled in that way. And secondly, all of the materials that I'm using here are ones that are readily available and relatively inexpensive and don't require uh, wood shops or anything to fabricate them, just basic tools. The basic tools that I would use would be a box cutter or utility knife with a sharp blade, some sort of a tape measure, a bold multi-surface marker such as a sharpie pen, and uh, something with a straight edge on it to mark straight lines and also to help fold corrugated cardboard over a sharp edge. Uh, I usually use a metal carpenter's um, scale for this, uh, easily obtained at a hardware store, but in reality I probably could have used a uh, edge of a scrap of plywood or a, a pine board or something like that for the same purpose. Another necessary item to have is some carton sealing tape or packing tape. I use what Uline calls their poly tape and the uh, part numbers mentioned here. And of course you need a uh, packing tape dispenser tool like this one. Often putting boxes together for the musical instruments since they're often large or oddly shaped and don't fit well into standard box sizes, it's necessary to fabricate boxes out of corrugated cardboard or heavily modify uh, regular boxes to the desired shape or even combine several boxes and when doing that it's just not strong enough to tape boxes together. For that reason I have a industrial hot glue gun and um, the long kind of hot glue gun glue sticks not the short little ones like you can buy in the hardware store uh, but if you're going to be bonding large pieces of cardboard together you need you need to be able to heat the glue up quickly and keep it hot and more importantly when you're injecting a lot of hot glue all at once or over a short period of time you need to be able to have a gun that can melt it that quickly at that rate of use a lot of the instrument cases or instruments themselves need to have some blocking in the cardboard boxes to hold them in position. And I usually build that blocking out of styrofoam sheets. Uh, large sheets of styrofoam are readily available in big box uh, supply houses such as Home Depot or Menards or uh, Lowe's. Uh, quite inexpensively I can usually buy uh, a stack of say one inch thick styrofoam sheets uh, from places like that for just a few dollars and by the way I would caution against buying things like that from hobby suppliers I find that they usually carry them but they overcharge dramatically for them it's a lot more economical to buy them from uh, companies that sell them for use in building construction and so on anyway 
to cut the foam, you can make a real mess with styrofoam if you just try to cut it with a blade or a saw or something like that. Really the only way in my mind to cut it is to use a hot knife foam cutter. The one that's here is just one I bought on eBay, but the major packaging suppliers such as Uline and others do sell similar tools and they make very quick and clean work of cutting the foam. And by the way, um, this is more about taking pictures of instruments before selling them, but I usually buy from a hobby store these large sheets of, um, I guess they're maybe eighth of an inch thick, uh, foam poster board, uh, which I lay down on the floor and set one up against the wall and take pictures of the instruments while sitting on that backdrop. But also in this same set of photos here, um, I'm showing the scale that I use to weigh the instruments by themselves or weigh the uh, instruments once boxed up for shipment so I know how much to charge for shipping. And uh, especially when you're dealing with musical instruments, they tend to be larger objects and they can easily cover up the entire scale if you just get a regular heavyweight postal scale. So I favor models like this which have a remote uh, reading um, readout or remotely located readout I should say so you can put it some distance away from the scale or even keep the scale on the floor and have the readout up on a tabletop. They're not that expensive and they're very handy for this kind of thing. I don't have any pictures for this, but uh, as a supplier of cardboard boxes that are of decent quality, uh, my first choice is Amazon. I get enough shipments from Amazon that I save any boxes that are potentially large enough to be used for various musical instruments. And I also uh, buy new boxes, usually from the local UPS store, although the FedEx stores uh, are similarly useful. Uh, they sell a wide range of high-quality corrugated cardboard boxes, uh, all sorts of sizes and configurations. And um, for most instruments that I can't fit in my stock of Amazon boxes, I will run out to either the FedEx or UPS stores and buy my boxes from them. All right. My first case study is a pair of vintage clarinets that's a matched pair. I think these were in A and B flat, and they came in a case that accommodated both of them. Since the case was in good condition and strong, and it fits the instruments well, I decided the only thing I needed to do was prevent the instruments from rattling around inside the case, so I rolled them in some a lightweight bubble wrap and um, also uh, decided that the latches on the case were not quite strong enough so I put a couple of large zip ties around the case to make sure it did not come open and then I just put it inside a cardboard box that was slightly larger than the case and filled the voids with foam peanuts uh, the box is really just there to keep the case from getting damaged because the case itself protects the instruments and there's not much value in making the case uh, to box clearance really large you know even a half inch or something would be good enough if there's a little padding or blocking between them the next case study is a fairly recently only barely vintage uh, cornet in a case that was designed and fit to it and again the case is strong and all I really want to do is prevent any unnecessary rattling around of the instrument inside its case and protect the case from scratches in transit. So in this instance there's no extra padding inside the case itself but the case is padded slightly inside the cardboard box in this instance there's not a lot of clearance so it's really just bubble wrap not even any blocking or anything else here's an instance where I used a uh, ready-made box that was too tall 
and you can see in this photo where the box originally had its top flaps in one position but it's much taller than the instrument so I've cut the corners of the box down to allow the uh, box to be shorter in the vertical dimension and it gets folded over right on top of where that bubble wrap is. Getting a little more elaborate, here's the third case study. Um, in this instance, it's a vintage saxophone, once again in its proper case. So I just put a little bit of bubble wrap around the instrument to fit it a little more snugly inside the case. And I also taped the uh, utility box in the corner shut. That has the neck of the instrument, the lyre, the neck strap, the mouthpiece, and its ligature and cap. All of those things are individually wrapped in bubble wrap so they can't bang against each other. And then to keep them from getting out and damaging the instrument, that just a piece of packing tape is put over the lid of that utility area. Uh, then externally, the case just needs some blocking. Since this is getting to be a bigger instrument here, I didn't want to fill it with uh, a lot of foam peanuts and I just used various pieces of styrofoam for blocking it up from the bottom of the case and then pieces of styrofoam jammed in along the sides and ends uh, to block it out from there and uh, a couple sheets on the top just to fill it up to where the box folds over and then tape the box shut and it's good to go. I want to clarify one thing here. Um, I usually attach these styrofoam pieces, once they're cut, to the inside of the box or to each other if I'm combining several of them into a bigger block using the hot melt glue gun. But I have to be very careful with that. Um, you don't want to put too much down because the glue remains quite hot for a while and it's enough to melt the styrofoam and the glue can actually melt into the styrofoam and then not actually be on the surface where it's needed. Um, the glue applied more sparingly will cool off much quicker and won't melt itself into the styrofoam as badly. Uh, but then of course you have to position it very quickly before it gets too cool and is no longer tacky. Uh, Sometimes I also use construction adhesive, uh, such as liquid nails, if it's a situation where the hot glue isn't working well on the blocking, I'll switch to using construction adhesive in those instances. I've even used just things like bathtub caulk if I happen to have a, a tube of it around or RTV or something like that, anything that'll adhere the, the pieces together but in general the construction adhesive or the hot melt glue works best for me. Well the next case study here is an old cornet that has a bunch of tuning crooks and a, a case but a lot of uh, rattling around of the parts so the first thing that was done is to uh, wrap up the smaller parts in some bubble wrap keep them from rattling around so much and then packing some larger bubble wrap into all the loose spaces to stabilize the larger parts. A couple of large zip ties keep the case from popping open in transit. Some of these old cases have pretty poor latches. And then the case goes into a box that's not a whole lot larger than the case. The case really provides the protection for the instrument and the box provides protection for the case, but all it really needs is to have some uh, foam peanuts to pad out the the voids. And in this instance, if I'd had some styrofoam sheets, I would have blocked it with styrofoam sheets rather than using up the foam peanuts, but I used what I had on hand. And a bit of packing tape and we have a nice secure box and a well-protected instrument. The next case study is of a cornopian with Stotzel valves and a pigtail crook. In this case, the crook is just wrapped in some uh, poly sheeting, taped up, and uh, either, I think it's scotch taped 
to the body of the instrument, keep it from getting lost and rattling around. And then the entire instrument is wrapped in some uh, poly bagging. Uh, sometimes I'll use something like saran wrap for this. It's just to keep all the foam peanuts and stuff away from the horn. Sometimes I use poly bagging. Sometimes I use poly sheeting that's taped around the instruments. Sometimes I use bubble wrap for the same purpose. Since this cornopian doesn't have a case, it needs to be blocked within the cardboard box. And I started out with a sheet of styrofoam against the front and a couple of ramps of styrofoam, each made out of two thicknesses glued together along the back of the case, and then uh, some more blocking at the left and right of the case. The cornopian sits on the ramps and slides down them until it contacts the piece of blocking at the front of the box. Some more styrofoam sheet protects the top of the bell rim, and then another piece of blocking uh, along the left ramp keeps the instrument from riding up on the ramps. The remaining voids are filled with foam peanuts, and then the Amazon box is taped up. Here's another cornopian, also polybagged, and the blocking is done a little differently here. I'm not using the ramp method. I'm actually building pillow blocks uh, plus buffers and box strengthener panels at the left and right, which helps provide some additional crush resistance for the box and the instrument is just suspended on its pillow blocks in the middle of the box. And then of course uh, I fill the voids with foam peanuts. One thing to point out here is you can see the two vertical pillow blocks more or less in the middle of the box and then there are some styrofoam panels to the front and rear which go up against the pillow blocks. Those are important because the instrument is actually being supported by the pillow blocks and during transit if they're not attached to the box those pillow blocks can wiggle out of position and then the horn can slip around inside the box. If it comes into contact with the side of the box then any impacts against the side of the box will be translated directly to the instrument causing damage. It's always important to keep the instrument away from the sides of the box not only so that impacts against the side of the box, even from just setting it down hard, those impacts are not translated directly to the brass or the body of the instrument, but also uh, if there's any crushing of the box, having the instrument held in the middle uh, will protect it. The styrofoam will collapse if there's enough crushing of the box, but it'll still help support the instrument in the desired location. So that's an important consideration when doing this type of blocking. In this fourth cornet case study, once again the cornet is inside a poly bag, and I started out with a smaller box, I think it was an Amazon box. I did a little bit of uh, pillow blocking using styrofoam sheet, but was not satisfied with the amount of space I had around the instrument. So I redid it in a slightly larger box, and this time I have a more complete blocking arrangement. Um, the instrument's much better protected. I was much happier with it this way. And of course uh, a little poly taping and the box is ready to ship. Here is a box being made for a bell front alto horn. Um, I started out with just a couple pillow blocks and then I gradually added additional pieces of blocking and I cut out the pillow blocks a little bit with the hot knife and uh, once I got the instrument supported and it wasn't going anywhere then instead of putting in styrofoam blocks to stabilize and prevent shifting of the primary pillow blocks in this instance I took an alternative approach and just packed the voids with some crushed craft paper. This can often be more expeditious than using the foam peanuts or using the additional blocking and serves the same purpose. And I hadn't mentioned craft paper earlier on as a supply I use, but 
this is probably as good a time as any to mention that having a roll of craft paper is pretty handy. It's a lot stiffer than, say, old newspaper, and it's not too expensive, so I do keep some of that around. And uh, once again, I had a good box that worked out quite well. All right, the next case study involves a pair of instruments, a vintage horizontally held flugelhorn and a sort of generic baritone. Since they were going to be shipped together, first the flugelhorn was wrapped up in bubble wrap, although first its pigtail crook was separately wrapped in bubble wrap and just taped into a uh, nook in the overall shape of the flugelhorn. And uh, then it was placed in a position where it would kind of nestle into the natural shape of the baritone and secured to it with uh, multiple zip ties. And then it was discovered that the edge of the flugelhorn's bell would kind of dig into the side of the bell flare of the baritone's bell, so a piece of stiff foam was stuck in there. It's black in this picture. And then the entire instrument combo was wrapped up in bubble wrap and sealed uh, by wrapping around in all directions and taping. A cardboard box was found that was a good size fit for the instrument, and if I haven't mentioned it already in this video, I try to buy boxes when I buy them that have the cut down top so they're pre-perforated, usually at one or one and a half inch increments. So all you have to do is cut the corners down and then the box will fold it to a shorter vertical dimension to better fit the object and minimize shipping costs. Since this is a larger instrument, I didn't really want to fill the box with foam peanuts. And there's a fair amount of weight in the instrument. And I found that these heavier instruments that are not protected by cases within the box can easily shift even through the foam peanuts and contact the sides. So I really do prefer, whenever I can, to use blocking rather than just uh, have the horn swim in a sea of foam peanuts. So these pictures show the blocking being built up. With the box corners cut down to the desired height, I took one of the panels and hot melt glued a couple of blocking strips that will press down on the top of the horns and keep them in position in their blocking that's part of the bottom of the box. And then the top is folded over and it's all secure. The next case study is of a valve trombone. I polybagged the top and bottom halves, or the bell section and the valve section, of the trombone. And this just keeps foam peanuts and so on out of them if I use foam peanuts, and generally protects against rubbing and other uh, superficial damage to the instrument in transit. But of course, bubble wrap would serve just as good a purpose as the polybagging. For this instrument and its box, I used a two-level uh, blocking scheme that involved pillow blocks. So a lower level of pillow blocks supports the valve section part of the instrument, and an upper level of pillow blocks built on the first level supports the bell section of the instrument. To prevent the uh, blocking and pillow blocks from shifting around, or turning sideways and therefore not uh, supporting the instrument properly, I jammed some wadded up craft paper in the voids. So the craft paper is not padding here. It's there to help support the blocking. In the next case study, I have a small tuba that needs to be shipped, and I could not find a suitable box that would just fit the tuba without being vastly oversized. So instead I bought two boxes at the UPS store and combined them. Uh, they basically telescoped one into another, so I built up both boxes keeping only the top end open, everything else being taped up. And I also used hot melt glue on the flaps to make it more secure. And then telescoped them one into another at the open ends. And then one by one, hot melt glued 
the uh, overlapping flaps to each other. This makes a very strong box. Since a box fabricated by joining other boxes doesn't have a natural opening, it's necessary to cut the one side open in such a way that it forms the necessary flaps uh, to allow the instrument to be put inside and then closed up again. Since this is a big horn and it's a big box, I'm not going to rely on foam peanuts. I'm going to use blocking and specifically pillow block type blocking. Due to the size and weight of the instrument and the fact that I only had one inch thick styrofoam sheets, I hot melt glue laminated three sheets together to make three inch thick uh, blocking. And as mentioned before, when working with these styrofoam sheets, you really need to have something like a hot melt knife or a foam cutting knife that does not make a bunch of uh, styrofoam crumbs that get everywhere. The hot blade knife works very well. In this instance, the entire weight of the tuba will be supported by these two main uh, foam pillow blocks. And to keep them from tipping and just to keep them in position, uh, additional blocking is hot melt glued to the sides of the box in such a way that it supports and keeps positional these pillow blocks. Also, the ends and edges of the pillow blocks are liberally hot melt glued to the sides of the box. With the tuba in position on its two pillow blocks, some additional blocking was put at the bell end and the bottom bow end. Then complementary pillow blocks are put on the top going up to the level of the top of the box. Here are three pictures that show additional details of the blocking. Because of the way the pillow blocks were supported, there was no need for additional void filling or supporting craft paper or anything like that. And this is actually a very robust system. It makes the box strong. It keeps the horn centered and away from the box. It supports the weight of the instrument quite well, but contributes almost nothing to the overall weight of the packaging. And the only thing that's left then is to fold over the tops, a little hot melt glue, a little bit of packing tape, and it's ready for shipment. As a side note, you can see in this photo that the top looks a little irregular and that's because when the top of the box was cut open there were still gaps and some scrap cardboard was laid in the middle to cover those gaps and once again that was held in place with hot melt glue and then the edges sort of sealed with packing tape. Alright, the next case study is for an Ophiclide and while I've built quite a few hard shell cases and shipping crates for Ophiclides of various sizes. This was the first time that I built just a simple cardboard box shipping arrangement for an Ophiclide. So I was improvising and learning on the job. Anytime an Ophiclide is put in a case or a box, the bocal needs to be removed. This always protrudes in an awkward orientation and position and it really just makes the box need to be a lot bigger if it's still attached to the instrument so it's best that it's removed and dealt with separately within the overall box. Here the Ophiclide is wrapped up in tape secured bubble wrap and the bocal is also wrapped up in bubble wrap. At this stage I wasn't sure if I was going to be using foam peanuts as packing material or if I was going to use some sort of blocking only arrangement so the bubble wrap was really precautionary and it did turn out to be handy but it might not have been necessary if I thought it through better up front I might have just polybagged the thing. Since the Ophiclite is a long narrow instrument Trying to come up with a box that's going to fit it is quite difficult. Either you end up with a really huge box that has a lot of wasted space, or you have the instrument under protected by using maybe just a lot of 
bubble wrap and maybe some craft paper over that, which some people do use when they ship off of Clyde's. That really provides minimal protection. So I resolved to use a more robust system, and it was going to be based on three equal-sized boxes, a standard size of 20 by 20 by 20, um, and then telescope them together to make a long, narrow box. I started by having two boxes built up with one end sealed and the other end open, and then the third box was just going to be kept as the intermediate piece between the two end boxes. Here, an end box is placed on the floor. The intermediate box, which is open at both ends, is partially telescoped onto the bottom box, and then the ophiclite is put next to it to get a better idea of how tall the overall assembly needs to be, and therefore where does the intermediate box get joined to the bottom box. Marks were made on the bottom box to show where the second intermediate box would be placed on it. Then the intermediate box is removed and some padding needs to be placed in the bottom that the bell of the ophiclite can rest on. In this instance I used a couple of sheets of styrofoam uh, board on the bottom and then built a thick bubble wrap pillow which sat on top of the uh, foam. The uh, foam boards on the bottom and the bubble wrap pillow were hot melt glued together and then two blocks of a different foam. I just used some scrap closed cell polyethylene foam blocks here but it could have been styrofoam. Uh, were hot melt glued to the sides. This is to keep the Ophiclide centered on top of its pillow, but because of the bell flare, I couldn't put all four blocks in at this time. I had to put two in, then slide the Ophiclide in, center it, and then put the other two blocks on. I decided to use foam peanuts after all, so I filled the voids in the bottom box with the peanuts right up to the top edge of the box. At this point, the bubble wrap covered bocal was placed alongside the body of the instrument and aligned with the corner of the box to give it the most clearance and then some packing tape was used to secure it in this position. Now the intermediate box has been telescoped down over the bottom box and aligned with the marks I made in the earlier step and I also used a carpenter's angle to verify that I'm not building a box that arcs off to one side or another due to misalignments between the telescoped sections. And uh, it's attached to the bottom box by lifting one flap at a time where they overlap and applying hot melt glue. And once that's pushed back together, then I lift the next flap and work my way around the box. And at the end, it's as if they were one box to start with. Here are a couple of views from the top of the way that the intermediate box looks when stacked on top of the first one. Much higher than this and there's a smaller dimension to the instrument even though the box remains just as wide and to avoid having to fill all of that empty space with foam peanuts I decided to stop using the peanuts as a form of blocking keeping them only to the bottom of the box and I also wanted to reinforce the center part of the box to improve its crush resistance. So I hot melt glued in some panels of styrofoam board. One of them is shown in this picture. I should also note that one of these foam boards is positioned between the bocal where it comes closest to the side of the box just to provide a little extra isolation uh, in that area in case the bocal should shift a little bit. At this point I prepared the third box which will be the top box in the same way I did the bottom box by hot melt gluing in a couple layers of foam board and then building a thick rolled up bubble wrap pillow and gluing that to the foam board. Now this can be upended and telescoped down over the assembly I've already built. Returning to that assembly already built, I don't want the foam peanuts to 
move into the top part of the box where they're not wanted. So I wadded up some craft paper and stuffed them around on top of the uh, the peanuts and sort of in between where the foam boards are used as reinforcing in the center of the box. Essentially the craft paper makes a plug for the foam peanuts. Some sort of pillow block is required at this level right on top of the craft paper in other words to prevent the instrument from shifting around leaning to one side or the other especially if it gets dropped or set down hard uh, with the box being laid horizontally. So I built out of some scrap corrugated cardboard a couple pillow blocks that look like this. They're sort of L-shaped with a fold and then a U cut out of them to match the diameter of the instrument. Here's one of the cardboard pillow blocks attached to the box. Its flap is vertical here and hot melt glued to the side of the box. Here's the other pillow block uh, glued to its side and they overlap and some hot melt glue was used to join the uh, two points, if you will, of one pillow block to the other so it forms one solid pillow block that spans the entire width of the box. It provides ex additional strength here. It also keeps the instrument from shifting. And thirdly, it prevents the uh, peanuts and the wadded craft paper from migrating up higher on this end of the instrument. Finally, the third box is upended and telescoped down over the lower assembly. And once again, its flaps are lifted one at a time and hot melt glued to the remainder of the box. Since the box is a bit unwieldy to lift uh, and carry, I used a uh, knife to cut a couple of slots in opposing sides near the top at a good height where an average height person can easily grab them in front of him and lift a little bit and then carry the box that way. I also marked it this end up, although it's not strictly necessary if it was transported in any other orientation it would still be fine. This method seems to have worked out quite well. It wasn't very difficult to do. The primary cost is the three purchased boxes. It uses not too many uh, foam peanuts, so not much dollar value there. Some scrap cardboard, some scrap foam sheetings, not very much bubble wrap either. And uh, mostly hot melt glue was the major expenditure besides the boxes themselves. And I don't know exactly what it is, but I'd be surprised if the overall weight of all packing materials here is more than a couple pounds or so. Uh, so very lightweight, but still quite strong. Now here's a case study for packaging a drum. It's an old snare drum. Uh, wrapped it in bubble wrap just as a general precautionary and blocked it in the box with about two inches of styrofoam board. By the way, this view shows pretty clearly the uh, adjustable cut-down type box. You can see the perforations. And then also put some styrofoam board blocking on the one of the top lids. Here's just checking that that lid folds down properly and contacts the drum. And then back filled all the voids with foam peanuts just to keep the drum centered. I could have done this with blocking on the sides too, but I'd run out of the styrofoam. So the foam peanuts worked instead. My final case study is going to be for a old antique bass drum. Once again I could not find a box that had the proper dimensions so I got two boxes from the UPS store that had the adequate uh, height to handle the diameter of the of the drum and cut one side out of each box and then joined them together uh, with a certain amount of overlap to get exactly the right dimensions. Here's a view that shows the overlap area with a black line drawn with a sharpie marker 
going vertically and then it also shows the hot melt glue pattern on the left of that line. Here's the overall box after joining the two halves but the tops and the bottoms are still open. Remember that I joined them on their sides instead of on their ends. And then here's with the bottom folded over, hot melt glued and taped. Here's the box right side up. You can see on the left there's one of the overlapped sections and its flap. Once you overlap the boxes like this, it's a bit of a chore to get them to bend cleanly at the perforations because the perforations don't line up exactly. So I usually use a straight edge of wood or a piece of metal to bend them over again to make sure that it bends properly and cleanly. The drum is pretty strong, at least on its round edge. Uh, you know, the wood is reasonably thick for the weight. Uh, so I just use some simple styrofoam blocking to keep the drum off of the bottom of the box. This is actually the box tipped on its side. I had to crawl inside the box on my hands and knees because I couldn't reach far enough in otherwise to attach these styrofoam blocks with the hot melt glue. With the drum sitting on its bottom blocking, two more blocks were added to keep it from rolling and then a couple of more blocks were added to keep it from tipping sideways. I did not block it at the bottoms in this dimension. As I've done on some other cases shown in this video, uh, I attached a piece of blocking for the top and rather than try to tape it to the, the drum or something like that, I hot melt glued it to one of the lids at the top of the box so that it would fold down and contact the top of the drum. Because I had run out of foam blocking material, uh, I didn't have a way to prevent the drum from moving on the bottom and shifting off of its bottom blocking. So I just decided as a last resort to fill the voids with styrofoam peanuts. It really uses a lot of peanuts and I hate doing it this way. Plus it's a big mess for whoever receives the, the drum. But I needed to get it out, get it shipped, and this was the only way I could accomplish it at this point in time. It worked. So here's the final box and it's positioned right next to the Ophiclide box from the previous case study. As with the Ophiclide box, this is an extremely light bit of packaging for the bass drum. The drum itself weighs very little. The box only weighs, you know, maybe a pound and a half with everything. Uh, so it it's really very light, but yet quite strong, and the drum is certainly well enough protected.